uh, thank you so much for coming back after after the break. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed uh, lunch. And uh, yeah, let's get started to uh, talk about exploring alternative interactions in JavaScript. So my name is Charlie Gerard. I'm a senior research engineer, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today is not at all what I do in my uh, in my day-to-day -day job. I work in cybersecurity, but I love uh, exploring what can be done with the web and with JavaScript uh, on the side. So I know that with the current advancements in AI, we're talking a lot about LLMs and having uh, usually text as input and text as output. But I want to talk about the different types of inputs that we can work with when we are uh, working with the web. So if you're a front-end engineer, you might uh, know some of the inputs I'm going to talk about. But I want to basically think about how can we interact with the web and with web applications, but in a different way than just using the keyboard and uh, the mouse. So the first input that I want to talk about is webcam data. And in general, you know, if you're a JavaScript engineer, you, you, know, you know that you can access the webcam from the laptop or from your phone or an external webcam plugged into your device. And you can use the get user media web API. And usually you get the live stream data from the webcam and you can display it and have, you know, um, you create a web application where you can have calls and things like that. But you can also use that data with uh, models from TensorFlow.js to create motion controlled applications. So I'm going to show a few different, uh, you know, uh, examples of that. And first of all, we can use models that allow you to do post detection. So using the live feed from the webcam, you can actually then kind of feed that into a machine learning model and have access to certain key points around the body. And uh, the first example that I'm going to show you in a minute is, uh, so I'm, I'm actually glad that you can't see what the video is yet, uh, because it, I created a um, clone of a Beat Saber game. So if you've never played Beat Saber uh, in the past, it's usually something that you play on a VR headset uh, that can be quite expensive. And you have joysticks in your hand, and you kind of like smash some beats. Um, and the thing is, I didn't want to have to buy a VR headset. So I was thinking, OK, I know that you can do post detection with TensorFlow.js. I can write JavaScript. I know that you can do 3D in the browser. So I wanted to recreate a game where instead of having joysticks, I would play with my hands. So if we could just uh, roll the video, it's about a minute. Um, and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. <laughs> If we could maybe pause the video, I think I... Yeah, thank you. Um, so here in this example, it was a version that I built in like 2019. So, you know, it's quite a while ago now. And it was with one of the first versions of the pose detection model. And since then, I think it's been improved a little bit. So in this demo, I was going kind of like slow. But when I updated it to one of the new models, I don't have a video for that. But I was able to play the game in like hard mode, so going a lot faster. Uh, and it was super fun. So I was able to basically create an experiment or a web, a web experiment where you can, instead of having to have thousands of dollars to buy a web VR headset, you can actually have the same experience uh, in the browser. And it was just projected on a wall you know, for like effects and stuff. But it was just running from uh, my laptop. And with the same, like for this particular example, I was using uh, basically the key, the key points for my wrists. But then you can also use key points for the rest of the body using the exact same model. And that's not a video, that's just uh, an image. But for some of you who might have watched uh, Squid Game on Netflix, so the series is about, you know, a lot of people are in this big room and there's this doll that, you know, uh, turns its, he its head. And when it's not looking, you're supposed to run until the other side of the room. And if the doll turns its head and you're moving, you die, basically. So, uh, and <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking, oh, it would have been awesome for Netflix to kind of create an experiment where you can do that at home a little bit. And uh, so I didn't build the, the interface uh, itself is, I didn't build it, but then uh, the person who had just, I forgot his name, uh, I apologize, but the, um, the, the interaction was just, I think, moving the mouse. And I thought, wow, you could do it. You can actually integrate that with the PostNet model and you can do, you know, in your living room. Um, and what was interesting with that is that then you start thinking about, okay, so if I want to build something like this, what kind of key points do I want to use? Is it just the wrist and then the ankles? And what does it mean to not move? Is there a threshold, like a delta between my movements, between before, after? So it's kind of like fun, even in terms of like um, thinking about that in terms of engineering. And uh, so yeah, I don't have a video, but you can imagine I was running in my living room and you know, basically as soon as the doll was turning, I was like, eee! and trying not to die. Um, so this is like for pose detection, so for key points around the entire body. 
but you can go a bit more granular and go into hand detection. So if you only want to focus on the, the movements of the hands or the fingers, there's a lot of key points that you have access to as well. And for this particular example, uh, I think if we could play it in the background, I think I can talk over it. So I was thinking about um, how, what would it be like to design interfaces with my hand movements? So it was like, I think when I was a kid, I really liked uh, Minority Report, but in the movie, they had gloves. It wasn't really using cameras. So here it was just an experiment using, again, uh, TensorFlow.js and the hand detection model. And I kind of like hooked that in like a Figma plugin. And I was basically just dragging different layers and like experimenting with different gestures. Okay, what would it be like to zoom or to yeah, drag layers? And obviously it was kind of like a minimal prototype uh, because, and it's not, I'm not pretending that that would replace using the mouse and the keyboard, but if you started to think about how to maybe merge different types of interactions and if you could, you know, create interfaces with just movements, what would it look like? Would different fingers be, you know, different actions, what kind of movements and things like that? So that's what I, what I like to, um, to, to think about when, uh, when I use uh, these like uh, machine learning models. So here it's for hand detection. But we can even go more granular and think about gaze detection. So they have, there's a very good um, machine learning model uh, you know, available with TensorFlow.js as well that can really uh, check the movements of your eyes. So uh, if we could also play in the background, please, because uh, I think I can uh, explain. So here it was a prototype of a gaze control keyboard that was actually a web-based prototype that was uh, replicating uh, an experiment built by Google for Android. It was an application for people who have um, um, motion who are restricted in, restricted in their in their uh, ability to to move, so they have an interface that ca they can control with their eyes. In this example, uh, I just use the direction left and right uh, with my eyes. So if you only have access to two different types of inputs, I could have added looking up or looking down. But I thought, okay, you know, I just want to use left and right. What would that look like? And then you end up having a keyboard interface that's split into two, and you end up kind of having like almost like a binary search where with the letter that you know you want to type is in a section and then it just you know split into two until you have one letter um, left. So um, yeah, that's an example of something that you can do with gaze detection. But then with what I learned uh, building this, I ended up thinking, what would it be like to write code with my eyes? So if we could also play it in the background, thank you. Um, so then I kind of moved on and it's like there's because it's JavaScript, there's like an electron app with the keyboard interface and then the camera, and then it's like talking to a VS Code plugin to write code. And it's like <laughs> so, and what's interesting in this as well, it's not only the code that you write to have this working, but you start thinking as well, well, okay, when I write code, there's only a certain amount of things that I can do, right? Here it was to create a very basic a React app. And when you use React, if you've used React before, okay, there's the concept of creating a variable or a component or things like that. And there's a very limited, you, you can't just write, you know, free text. Um, I mean, maybe with LLMs now you can. But in this uh, particular example with VS Code, you already have plugins that have access to snippets. And instead of writing, I would select the snippets with, uh, with my eyes. So again, I'm not pretending that in a few years we'll all write code with our eyes, but you could be thinking about, okay, on top of just having, you know, having access to, I can type, I can scroll, maybe your eyes would be doing something else, uh, you know, like so, yeah, some, something else that you would trigger uh, in VS Code. So this is like just only using the get user media web API with welcome data, you can already do uh, all of that stuff. And that's only the things I've built, but there's a lot more examples out there. But there's something else that you have access to with the get user media, uh, yeah, get user uh, media API is audio data. And we don't really think that much about audio data when we think about machine learning. But you know, usually again, if you're a front-end engineer, you have access to the microphone from the device that you're using, you call get user media and you, uh, you know, have the audio Boolean that you set to true. And you can also feed that into uh, TensorFlow.js models and you can have sound controlled apps. So what do I mean by that? There was a research paper around uh, acoustic activity recognition that was, I think, by uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, again, that prototype was from 2019 as well, so quite a few years ago now. But it's basically using sound data to be, be able to classify different activities. And that research was originally to improve uh, home IoT uh, devices or systems. So instead of having to buy an IoT coffee machine, an IoT fridge, an IoT toaster, and all the, all the things that are very expensive, you could have one device that listens to the sound that these appliances make. For example, when the toaster is done, I'm sure if you have a toaster, you can imagine what, uh, what it sounds like, or the sound of like your uh, door of the fridge, you know, when you open and close, you know, I can hear it in my head. But uh, <laughs> so you have these, um, these appliances 
make certain noises that you can train a machine learning model to recognize, and then you can have a single system that kind of knows a little bit about your, about your house. But it can be used for other things. In this particular uh, GIF here, it was just the difference between me speaking at the beginning and then the sound of claps. And it was me experimenting with, if you, have, if you get this raw data from the microphone and you visualize it through a spectrogram, I was thinking, okay, if I can visually see the difference uh, of like, the signature between these sounds, then a machine learning model will probably also um, see the difference. So here it was my particular, like my specific prototype built uh, with web technologies, but this uh, technology is actually also used, I think, by a Google uh, project around uh, trying to stop uh, illegal deforestation, where there's Android phones in trees that listen to the sound of chainsaws, and then they, uh, it alerts uh, rangers you know, when there's uh, you know, illegal deforestation happening. So we never really think about audio data that much, but there's actually a lot that you can do. And uh, another example then, I moved on to, uh, oh, I forgot I had this one. Uh, so <laughs> if we, hmm, I don't know, okay, I'm gonna explain and then I'm gonna uh, play the video because there's sound. So this was built in 2020 when I was watching the, it was like a Apple keynote where they released the model on the watch that was um, having a counter for 20 seconds for people, you know, for, for them to wash their hands. And as I was watching there, the conference, I realized, well, actually, I think I know how to build that. So in just two hours on my couch watching <laughs> the, the conference, I rebuilt a web-based version. Um, so maybe if we could just play a few seconds, I don't think it's super long. Um, I'm just gonna talk over it. So um, here you can see <laughs> the thing. And uh, yeah, in just a couple hours, I built uh, an interface on the web that you know, listens to the sound of water, and then it starts and stop uh, a countdown. And because it's built in JavaScript, you know, my laptop is right there, but you can also work on a phone or on a tablet, anything that can really um, run JavaScript. So again, instead of buying a very expensive watch, you can use the laptop you already have and the JavaScript you know. I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, and I still don't have an Apple Watch because now I have that. Um, so that's just like one uh, example where to me, uh, using machine learning in JavaScript, it's like you can build so many things, uh, even on your own. Like, I don't have a team and I don't have expensive stuff. Uh, but then like just one last uh, example with audio is then I moved on. That was more recent when I was reading another research paper that was looking at on-face interactions. And that is basically using, if you have your earphones that have a microphone in it, and you can actually uh, record the sound that your hand, your fingers make when you touch your head. I don't know, you can do it now if you want. But when you tap or when you slide, it makes a different noise, you can hear it. Um, and you know, these gestures would have a different signature in audio data. And then you can use that to train a machine learning model where if you have your phones that don't have touch on it, but you still want to be able to have you know, interactions, then you could be touching your face instead. I'm not saying that you know, this would actually really happen, but it's possible. So that's, uh, that's the whole point. And here I'm just basically, I had like a tap gesture um, to scroll and I think if I was uh, swiping, then it was going back up or things like that. So it's just experimenting. And you know, I, it, if you don't have access, if you don't work in academia and you have access to a team, you can still uh, experiment with different interactions um, with the knowledge that, that you have. Uh, okay, so we talked about video data, we talked about audio data, and uh, there's a third one that I want to talk about is hardware data. And what I mean by that is that, again, if you work on the web, uh, you can actually use a lot of devices that you can plug into uh, a web interface. You have the web Bluetooth API, the web USB API, and the web serial API. And if you get live data from these devices, you can use it, I mean, actually, you can build your own model, or there's also, um, I think, the platform Teachable Machine, or no, it wasn't, I forgot. But there was one uh, platform that actually had, um, that was built to interact with Arduino data. But uh, yeah, and as out of that, you can actually build motion controlled uh, applications. So one thing that I built again in 2019, I feel like my life stopped in 2019. But um, so <laughs> it was a, an experiment that I built to create my own model where I was holding a piece of uh, data in my hands and I recreated like an air street fighter game. So it, this does not use a camera. I could have been anywhere uh, in my living room. And uh, I, I recorded, on, over multiple weekends, I recorded live data of me doing three different gestures and uh, then created a, a model, a machine learning model using TensorFlow.js to recognize, you know, I think it was a punch, uh, Hadouken, and or you can I'll probably say it terribly. But, um, and then it was basically uh, with WebSockets streaming that data back to, uh, to the browser with this game here. So it was a prototype, the second character is not implemented. Uh, but I was able to build this, uh, this prototype like three different ways. There was live data from the phone using the generic sensor web API. I built a version using the Daydream controller, 
that probably doesn't exist anymore. It was the web VR headset by Google. And then another version with a custom made uh, Arduino controller with an accelerometer and gyroscope. So, you know, even if you don't have Arduino, you don't know how to do your own electronics, but you have a phone, there is a web API where you have access to live data from gyroscope and accelerometer. And using that live data, you can create your own model and then, you know, have some fun. Um, and Another, I think it's less demo that I'm going to show. Uh, so this, this one does not use TensorFlow.js in the particular demo. I just couldn't find the video where I did build something using TensorFlow.js. But you can use brain sensor um, devices that you buy you know, online, they're commercially available. And you can have access to live data from your brain activity and then use that with TensorFlow.js as well to create your own models and create uh, applications. So if we could just play the video, it's like, yeah, 30 seconds. <laughs> Um, so basically what's happening here is that I trained, um, there was, so this was not using TensorFlow.js, but it could be rebuilt using TensorFlow.js, where uh, I trained um, a model to recognize the patterns in my head when I was thinking about certain thoughts, so this one was jumping, and uh, then, you know, training that model to be able to recognize that from live data, and then, you know, streaming it back to uh, the browser and being able to play the dino game. So, you know, I was, I looked like I, you know, I was frozen because I was thinking so much. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> you're thinking about like tapping, like, you know, tapping my foot on the floor and then, you know, making the dino uh, jump. And uh, the, uh, the video that I couldn't find of the, um, the project that I built was to use live raw data to build a machine learning model to uh, recognize when I was blinking my eyes. So a lot of the models that we have sometimes are using the camera, but with the camera, you have to have a good lighting, you have to be at a certain distance, and using a brain sensor, you can be anywhere in a room and have the sensors across the forehead, you can get live data from that, and when you're blinking, there's like a spike in the data, and you can create your own machine learning model uh, with that. There's more experiments that I wanted to build, but I just uh, you know didn't have the time. But on uh, on this, that was basically everything I wanted to show today, and my point was that, wait, wait, I'm done, done, I'm done. <laughs> so the point was just that there's a lot more that you can do uh, with TensorFlow.js and with machine learning on the web that we are then what we're really talking about uh, right now. And it's been available for years. There's probably a lot more that you can do. Um, but I hope that you've learned something and that maybe you'll have uh, fun experimenting with it as well. But thank you so much. Mm -hmm.